came over just to say hello yesterday. It was such a fun time in Jupiter's. There was a lot of noise, and there was these wonderful appetizers and beer, and so much excitement. Why would you want to hear an old guy try to give a, an address over the noise? Don't do that. Just, just enjoy the, the time. So anyway, the first thing I want to do, I've watched the gestation of this activity over months, and we've been cheering on the team um, right from the, the, the time of the uh, the Obama administration's um, uh, uh, initiative, um, the GAIN initiative, and this whole new thing about nuclear innovation. And um, Rachel taking the bull by the horns and moving this thing forward. It's been an immense amount of work. Uh, we've been cheering her on, and the whole team has been helping her. The first thing I want to do before anybody forgets it is to thank the people that did this. I want to thank Rachel, thank Sarah, thank, thank Tim, I'm afraid I'm going to forget everybody. I want to thank uh, Kathy and so on. Who else? Rachel. Oh, Carolyn, yes. So anyway, thanks very much for doing this. I'm not a, as Rachel said, I'm, not, I'm, I'm sort of an unreconstructed hydrogen physicist. I'm a very non-traditional kind of guy. Um, but I know, having been in this department for close on five years and, and with the, the rest of the old guard here, the old barnacles, We've looked on this thing that's been brewing as uh, an absolute watershed moment. And in fact, you're living through it. You're at the very outset of your career. You, pre you probably do not realize what a watershed moment this is in the history of nuclear engineering that goes back to whenever you want to count it, 1939, 1942. Um, but you know, close on 70 years, um, turning the, the whole way we think about nuclear power on its head. Um, and I think people are going to look back at this moment in history um, when very young people with very new ideas uh, came in and um, you know, really developed an entirely new entrepreneurial outlook to it. Uh, as I said, I'm an unreconstructed uh, propeller head. I want to show you a very, one of my favorite photographs of mine. It actually conflates with a dream I had recently. Um, I spent several years uh, working in Brussels um, uh, every spring for the European Commission as part of their uh, expert reviewers, their framework program. And we had one evening a conference dinner at the Hotel Metropole. How many of you know Brussels or hung around there? Do you, you know this famous, it's one of these old world opulent uh, hotels, plush carpets, mahogany, everything. And um, you know, I remember I, after going there the first time, I'd always grab one of my friends to go over there, like, like making a pilgrimage. And you go up there, and of course the footmen very politely are there to deflect riffraff like me away. Unless, in your broken French, you'd go up and you'd say, I want to see the photograph. And of course, oh, at that point, you were ushered in with great pomp and circumstance into this room where one of the most famous meetings in the history of physics took place in 1911. It was the Solvay Conference when the entirety, it's like the New York Yankees of the world of physics, is there. There's Einstein, there's Lord Rutherford, the father of nuclear physics, there's Max Planck, there's Hendrik Lawrence, there's Madame Curie, Pierre Curie. Everybody was there. This was kind of a watershed moment in, in, uh, in history. And everybody goes into this conference room where, where the revolutionaries of 20th century physics uh, met there for this famous conference in 1911. And I, I had this dream the other night that 100 years from now, people were going to be going over to Jupiter's beer hall and they were to make a pilgrimage to look at a photograph on the wall, and it would be you, with Rachel playing the role of Madame Curie. So these were the revolutionaries <laughs> that saved the planet uh, from uh, basically uh, uh, stewing in its own carbon. And the revolution began here in Berkeley in 2016 with the first uh, innovation uh, uh, boot camp. Anyway, I love this photograph. Um, let me tell you a little bit about our, our department. We're a small department. We're described as kind of punching above our, our weight. Um, we're one of the oldest departments. I think probably the first department in nuclear engineering uh, probably dates from 1956. Uh, we came into existence with two or three others, I think, in 1958. I think North Carolina State might have been the first program. Um, We've uh, had a uh, very long and very distinguished career with many very distinguished people who come to our, our department. We had a reactor in the basement, a uh, trigger reactor in the basement of Echeverry uh, up until 1990. I hope you get a chance, if you haven't already, to go over and take a tour of Echeverry and meet some of the faculty over the next couple of weeks. 
Um, we are about eight FTE faculty with about another equal number of professors and residents, professors in the graduate school, uh, adjuncts and lecturers. It's a very small department compared to our peers, and yet I think we're very uh, distinguished and very highly ranked for what we, we do. Um, my predecessor, Per Peterson, uh, I think many of you know, uh, was on President Obama's Blue Ribbon Commission for America's Nuclear Future, uh, and uh, is, uh, has done many, many things with uh, Secretary Chu and Secretary Mones in terms of, of nuclear energy uh, as a, uh, on a consultatory basis. Uh, I would say if you describe our department, we have sort of four pillars, which I think we're really uh, excellent at, are kind of our hallmarks. Um, one is fundamental uh, science, uh, fundamental nuclear science. One is thermal hydraulics. Uh, one is reactor physics, including the area that Rachel works in, in high performance computing and algorithm development. Uh, and then nuclear materials, uh, Peter Hosman leads that. I think these are the areas where the department is most distinguished. A interesting theme, when I think many of you come from schools uh, uh, both in the, uh, the US and the UK, and I think you probably kind of sussed out that the character of the nuclear engineering department really depends geographically on where you are. Many of you, I think, have been privileged to come from schools um, that are kind of in a region or a, a, a district of a utility company that's kind of nuclear rich. And, that, and the companies there you know, uh, are actually you know, very much defined in a certain sense or help shape the character of your school, how the pedagogy takes place, what's the curriculum, who are your employers of choice, and so forth. Here, as you know, uh, <coughs> we're down to one reactor that has now nine years left. Um, it's a state that's been relatively cool to nuclear energy throughout. On the other hand, this is the cradle of the nuclear revolution. Ernest Lawrence invented the cyclotron about a quarter of a mile over there in the Cons Hall. If you want to make a pilgrimage to, to, uh, to over there to, you know, rub the wall on, and the fourth floor of the Con uh, is right there. Across the way in Gilman Hall, you have um, where uh, Glenn Seaborg separated uh, plutonium for the first time. Um, in fact, I have another photograph here. I won't show it to you, but a couple of years ago, the people over in the hazardous waste revetment say it came over to us with a little cigar box and said, you know, we think this is kind of important. It's been sitting here in storage for many years. And it was a little plastic case with a little eyepiece in it. And there was this little tantal or a little platinum wire with uh, what was purported to be the world's first macroscopic sample of plutonium-239 uh, that was created and separated by Glenn Seaborg. The plutonium was created <coughs> in uh, at the, the cyclotron here at Berkeley and at Washington University in St. Louis. And the separation, the chemical separation, took place at the, the Jones Laboratory, the Jones Metallurgical Lab, what was called the Met Lab, at the University of Chicago in September. It actually began in July, and they had sort of basically invented the, the chemistry. The world's best chemists created whole cloth, the chemistry, and the separation chemistry, for this very new and very unknown element all in the space of three months and created this little thing about the size of a, a flake of pepper. You could actually see it under a microscope. And that is, in fact, the world's first macroscopic sample of plutonium-239. As a consequence, um, this is kind of the birthplace of the DOE National Lab System. Um, Lawrence Berkeley Lab uh, started, depending on how you count, maybe 1931. Uh, Lawrence's cyclotrons were growing exponentially in size and ability to produce radiation. And, at some point, the university said, you know, uh, uh, Lawrence, old boy, this is uh, very fine indeed, but you're, this is getting to be a bit of a bother. Mm -hmm. You know, we're getting all these concrete walls and bunkers. Why don't you take your act up the hill? We own the land, go up there, have a nice laboratory. And that became the beginnings of Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Um, after, of course, Oppenheimer and Rutherford, and uh, uh, Oppenheimer and Teller, and Serber um, and Lawrence, played a uh, kind of a foundational role in the Manhattan Project in, in World War II. They, it was, it was, it was called uh, contract, uh, uh, it was a contract 42. Uh, the government set up a secret laboratory in Los Alamos, but it basically was an out branch. It was a branch of the University of California. 1952, they set up Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And of course, Sandia National Lab was set up as the engineering lab, partnering with the, um, you know, with the science labs. Uh, in the nuclear weapons uh, uh, mission uh, with its main campus in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and a, another branch in Livermore, California. 
And then we have the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center just down the Linzo. So within an hour's drive, within 40 miles, you have four DOE national labs, um, three of them actually significantly involved in national security, including Lawrence Berkeley Lab, although it's primarily a science laboratory uh, there as well. So the character of our department is, in fact, partially shaped by the fact that we have a DOE national lab system around us. It's viewed as a very attractive employer. Uh, I think most of our undergraduates, when they take, under, un, you know, take on nuclear engineering, actually are thinking about a PhD. Uh, not all, but I think probably a disproportionate high number think about going into PhD programs. And our graduate students here, uh, a lot of them do research at the DOE national labs and think of them as the employer of choice. I think Rachel mentioned um, in 2011, um, we, uh, Jasmine Guia, she's the principal investigator, uh, you may get a chance to meet her, submitted a proposal for the first competition that the Office of Nonproliferation of DOE uh, put out for a consortium. Um, um, and uh, it was a new model, kind of an experiment, by which uh, instead of giving out hundreds of individual investigator awards, uh, they were going to award a $25 million center for a consortium uh, of universities and national labs um, that would produce um, and prepare undergraduates and graduate students to go on to careers in non-corporation in the DOE labs and other federal service. Um, and we won the competition. We've had a great five years. Of a huge number of people have transitioned into these wonderful career jobs. There was just a recompetition for the next five years, and in fact, we won that one uh, again. Competition was very stiff. There were we. I think there were 11 proposals, excellent proposals around the country, but we carried the day and we're going to go on and try to do better and even uh, prepare more students for transitioning into the, into the lab system of the federal service over the next five years. Um, I, I don't know. I think you did a great job. Okay. Anyway, have a great two weeks. Come over and visit. Did they get an opportunity to? Um, so they have meeting spaces. Okay. In Echeverry, and people are mostly not around right now. It's true. Um, yeah. So, so I think they won't get to meet people as. as we're well. enjoying our last three weeks before we begin kind of early here, so we're going to be teaching. So after the boot camp, Rachel sleeps for three days, and then she begins teaching. So yes, that's pretty, the. Uh, that's pretty <laughs> good. And then we begin teaching. Any we questions? We've offered a tour of, of see it, and they Perfect. will. Okay. Um, and parents talking this afternoon, actually. Super. Any questions? Anything we can do to help you? Could you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I've had a, uh, a, a bit of a non-traditional career. Um, and the only way I hold myself up as an example to students is that I basically tell them not to worry about having a traditional career. Uh, and the, um, you know, I, I, I've had a career that I could have neither planned nor predicted. I sort of went along for the ride. It's been a lot of fun. I was, um, did my studies at MIT, taught there for a year, and came here. Um, I realized I'd spent my entire life within, uh, you know, up until age 26, uh, within a radius of 100 miles. And I said, this is not good. So I finally decided it was time to go west. And so I came out here to Berkeley Lab as a postdoc in, um, 1977. And um, interestingly, you say, how did, how did I parachute into a nuclear engineering department you know, at, at, at an age when most sensible people have retired? Well, interestingly, as soon as I sort of put my books on the shelf and got my seat warm, the phone rang. And it was the chairman of the nuclear engineering department said, we heard you taught at MIT. Um, we're in a bit of a fix. Uh, we just had an unexpected retirement. We're four weeks out from the fall semester could you teach a graduate nuclear course? And of course, like most overconfident young people, I said, sure. So anyway, I came down here, and a wonderful man, Stan Prusin, who just died a year ago, um, uh, a, um, kind of took me under his wing and taught me how to teach graduate nuclear physics, Army and Sheldon. And that kept up a lifelong friendship with Stan, who always had his students. He was a, a guy who was a big thinker about nonproliferation, who always had his students working out of at Livermore. And so when I, on my years at Livermore, I was an assistant professor at Stanford and I spent 25 years at Livermore. Um, the, um, we would have a lot of, you know, talks about this and that. Um, after 25 years at Livermore, um, 
where I built up a high energy physics group. We built you know, accelerators and detectors for Slack and CERN and Fermilab. Um, I, si I wanted to get back into academia. I just wanted to be a simple college teacher, but nobody would hire me. Everybody said, look, you've, you've been a manager. Would you like to be a vice president of this, a dean of that? I said, no, 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 I want to be a college teacher. So finally, I relented, ended up becoming vice president for research at the Naval Post Graduate School. And it was a lot of fun. We had a very close relationship with, uh, you know, in the security space with um, Livermore. And one day, the phone rang again. And this time, it was Stan Poussin. And he said, now you're in real trouble. Um, <clears throat> we need somebody who can come in uh, everybody's burned out, it's a small department, nobody wants to be chair, would you like to come and be the chair of the department? And I said, sure. So basically, it's been a year of talking, and I showed up here in January 12th, just four and a half years ago. Um, I'm still learning the landscape of what nuclear energy is all about today. It's a very, as you know, a very complex landscape. My own research, um, we have an experiment um, I've been uh, working on for 30 years, looking for the dark matter of the universe. You might say, why is such a thing uh, going on in the nuclear engineering department? Uh, our department is very eclectic and very sciencey, but not we're just doing crazy things. We're actually doing things which are kind of technically connected with important capabilities and expertise in the department. And in fact, we're using some of the sort of you know microwave cavity accelerator things that uh, Professor Kao, one of our department, has built up in the search for, for the dark matter of the universe. So I'm basically, you know, as I say, an unreconstructed particle physicist. If you're down at the sea, you may just poke your head around the corner. We have a high flux neutron generator there where we're doing more standard, more basic uh, nuclear physics studies. I um, showed them a picture of it yesterday. Great. Yeah, I've, I've sort of rediscovered the love of my youth, which is neutrons. And so we're actually <laughs> measuring cross sections for potential future medical isotopes. and. Uh, doing chip testing and lots of other interesting things as well. So um, I love teaching. I just taught the graduate nuclear course that I taught a long time ago uh, uh, for the first time in close to four decades. Stan didn't quite make it to help me the second time, but it, I think it came off passably well. Um, that's basically what I do. I'm having a ball, and uh, my greatest joy is hiring wonderful young faculty like Rachel and Max and and people like that. Uh, so, uh, and we're we're in the midst of a, a little bit of a hiring right now as well. Any other questions? Great. Have a great two weeks here.